hormones FSH and LH. Those hormones both go down to the ovary. FSH will then cause the production of estrogen and LH will cause the production of progesterone. Two different ovarian hormones. Those hormones go into the bloodstream to help build up the endometrial wall. But in the bloodstream, they're being monitored by the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus now senses that the set point, the levels that it wants to have for estrogen and progesterone, are getting too high. So we then go back up here in a negative feedback loop. I'll put a little negative sign there. And the hypothalamus and the pituitary would turn down the production of SSH so that we'd have less estrogen being produced. In the same way, it monitors LH in the bloodstream. Negative feedback loop up here again. The pituitary and the hypothalamus would do the same thing. They say, oh, there's too much LH. Let's turn down the production of uh, LH so that we have less progesterone in there negative feedback loops. Now, the interesting thing about these is that both loops are not really happening at the same time. Let's find out why and that'll be the key to understanding this whole process. Now let's go ahead and try and put all these pieces together. If you look at this slide here, I have several diagrams that show what's going on in the menstrual cycle. And the one I want to start with is the second one right here. This one shows us the levels of LH and FSH in the bloodstream. Take a look in the first 14 days here in the follicular stage. Now you can see that we start out here, the levels of LH and FSH are pretty much constant, not much change there. As we get to the end of the follicular stage, oh, shall we say at about day 10 or so, something starts to happen. FSH starts to go down. Now why would FSH go down? We'll take a look again at the screen before us and see what's happening in negative feedback. Do you see here that FSH stimulates the uh, follicle to produce estrogen, which causes negative feedback, which turns down the levels of FSH. So yeah, at about day 10, negative feedback is kicking in and the levels of FSH go down. But take a look at the other one here. Look at LH. LH starts to go up. I mean, that's the exact opposite of what's going on. Look at it, suddenly has a huge peak here and goes up. Why would that happen? Well, let's take a look back at that picture one more time. You can see here that when we go back to the picture, we should have negative feedback, which should also turn down LH and reduce it. But that doesn't seem to happen, just the opposite. It seems to build up. Why is that? And the reason is, because there is no corpus luteum. LH is being produced by the pituitary to stimulate the corpus luteum, which should cause negative feedback, but there is no corpus luteum. Remember, it only appears after ovulation at day 14. So there can be no negative feedback because one of the pieces of the puzzle is not there yet. So what happens? LH is being produced, but it keeps building up, and it gets higher and higher in concentration. And here's the interesting thing that you really need to know. That spike in LH there at day 10 to day 14, that's what causes ovulation, a surge in LH. And then we get ovulation, a rupture, and then we first see the appearance of the corpus luteum. So, the interesting thing that's going on here, if you look at the picture, the left side of the feedback loop is only really occurring in the follicular stage from day to 14. And the right side now kicks in, and that's only going to happen in the luteal stage at day 14 through 28. Let's take a look down here at this picture. I'll give us a different color so you know what I'm talking about here. At number four. Now number four shows the levels of estrogen and progesterone in the bloodstream, both ovarian hormones. Take a look at estrogen first of all. Estrogen is being built up in the first period, the follicular stage, and it gets quite high until ovulation. Why is that? Take a look at this picture again. 
FSH from the pituitary is stimulating the follicle. As the follicle gets bigger and bigger, right, it's being built up in preparation for ovulation, yeah, it would start producing more and more estrogen and those levels go up. And estrogen is being used to maintain the endometrial wall. Let's take a look though what happens after ovulation. Take a look at progesterone. There's no progesterone really in the first follicular stage. Why is that? Again, there's no corpus luteum yet, so there's nobody to produce progesterone. But what happens after ovulation? After ovulation, there is a corpus luteum, so yeah, we start to get large amounts of progesterone coming up here. Now, if you look what's going on at the picture number five, right below these guys, you can see their effect on the endometrial wall. Estrogen in the first phase is being used to build up the uterine wall, the endometrial, and there it is, getting quite big, right? But after ovulation, estrogen levels go down, so the wall should fall apart, but it doesn't. Why not? Because after ovulation, the corpus luteum takes over by producing progesterone, and progesterone continues to build up the endometrial wall. And here you can see it's getting bigger and bigger under the influence of progesterone. That should be fine. It's ready for the egg. But something happens here. What's going wrong towards the end of the whole menstrual cycle? Well, what's going on, if you look back here, is that the corpus luteum is starting to degenerate. It's going downstream. Why? Because of negative feedback again. Remember? LH stimulating the corpus luteum to produce progesterone. The hypothalamus and pituitary sense that. They do negative feedback, turning down LH, and so the right side of that feedback loop, remember that? Starts to cause negative feedback and the corpus luteum degenerates. Therefore, the levels of progesterone start to go down. Nobody's there to maintain the endometrial wall, and then you have menstruation occurs. Menses, day zero to five. That's the menstrual cycle. Now, if you don't understand that, think about two things here. First of all, how could we have an oral contraceptive? Well, an oral contraceptive, if you look back at the feedback loop here, if you had levels of progesterone and estrogen which were very, very high in the bloodstream, that would automatically cause negative feedback. The pituitary would turn down its production of SSH and LH, and you would not have a developing follicle. The other thing which is interesting to understand about this is what would disrupt the cycle? Well, obviously, that would be fertilization. So, we had ovulation. An egg appears in the fallopian tube. If a sperm comes in contact with it and fertilizes that egg, we now have a fertilized egg which starts to produce a new hormone we've never seen before. And that hormone is HCG, which stands for human chorionic gonadotropin. This is the hormone basically the little dipstick uh, pregnancy tests are looking for there, what we used to call the rabbit test. What's the purpose of that hormone? Well, that hormone takes over the role of LH. It maintains the corpus luteum. If it maintains it, the corpus luteum will not degenerate as much as it did before and continue to produce progesterone. The progesterone continues to maintain the endometrial wall so it doesn't fall apart in menstruation. And then, as the fertilized egg continues down the fallopian tube to reach the uterus, it still finds an intact endometrial wall and it can implant itself in there. And that would be both sides of the menstrual cycle.